You know what really amazes me? Songwriters. I mean, I listen to a, a great song, I think, how did they come up with that? I mean, how did they come up with a melody? And how did they come up with these words? And, and how did they come up with what instrumentation to use? You know, how to use the piano or a bass or, or drums or, or what have you. You know, how did they get this all to work together? It, it seems like they came up with some great, some great theme, some great melody, you know, some catchy tune, uh, the, the hook they'll call it. Something that will give you earworms later and make that thing just come up over and over in your mind. You know, how did they do that? And, and then add the orchestration over the melody. You know, they have the melody, and then they add the orchestration to it, and then they add all these other things. This amazes me. The other day I was walking and I was listening to Pandora, and a, a song came up. It was a Beatles song, uh, A Hard Day's Night. And as I was listening to it, all of a sudden, there was cowbells. There was a cowbell. And I'm thinking, was Ringo Starr playing the cowbell on this song? I mean, whose idea was it to use a cowbell? And I don't know if I'd ever heard the cowbell before. And I thought, you know what, really, without the cowbell, it wouldn't be the same song. It wouldn't be as catchy. Who had the idea to do that? And you listen to you listen to a song, and, and all of a sudden you, you'll hear the bass guitar, and you you'll notice what they're playing, and it's a little bit different than the melody. Or, or, or you'll hear the piano, or, or or stringed instruments, or what have you. It just amazes me. I some of you hear is counter melody. It's just it's just an amazing thing. When I look at the Gospel of John. I begin to think of John as a master composer. I mean, this really comes out in the book of Revelation, but it also comes out in the book of John, where he has this great melody, this great theme song that he's trying to play. And it, it, he's got a great theme song here, by the way. The theme of, of, the, of this masterpiece is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, and I want you to come be, to belief in Him. But as you begin to listen to this masterpiece, you realize that while there's some other instruments playing in this song, there's some, there's, some counter, there's some counter melodies going on here that you don't maybe at first quite notice that are, are quite amazing. And, and you can miss the subtext unless you listen very carefully. And today we're going to be looking at John the fifth chapter verses 30 and following which really plays this counter melody that if you're not listening for it you may not hear so let's read it and I'll come back and we'll talk about it a little bit more Jesus says I can do nothing on my own initiative as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will but the will of him who sent me if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me. And I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I received is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you'll have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. 
I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus is proving and declaring his deity. He and the Father are, are one. That's his main purpose. That's John's main purpose of the book, by the way, is to convince us that Jesus really is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, that he is deity. And running parallel with this main melody of deity and belief is a counter melody. There is the constant reference to unbelief. I hope you see that in this text. Not just unbelief we'll see in Gospel of John, not just unbelief, but the increasing hostility and animosity that people have towards Jesus. Now this amazes me. I've always wondered about this. Why is it that some people just won't believe? How is it that there's so much unbelief in the world? We look around and it seems like so many people do not believe in Jesus. There is a lot of unbelief. Beginning back in verse 17 all the way through verse 47 is one long discourse. I and the Father are one. We have one work. We have one purpose, one goal. We are the same. We do the same thing. Uh, and then he begins to talk about the witnesses of his deity. I mean... How much evidence do you need? What do you need to prove that Jesus is the Christ? And he starts talking about these witnesses that will testify for the fact that he is really God. And, of course, under the Jewish Old Testament, you had to have two or three witnesses to confirm anything. And so Jesus is going to bring out the witnesses. He's going to bring out this, these uh, witnesses who will testify for who he actually is. And yet, even after you look at all the evidence and all the witnesses and you hear all the testimony, there are still some who do not believe. Unbelief. It's amazing. Unbelief is amazing. You see, back in verse 16, he says, For this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus. They're persecuting him. They have nothing good to say about him. That they're they're antagonistic toward Jesus. And then just two verses later in verse 18, it says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Not only was there unbelief, not only was there antagonism, there was, they wanted him dead. They wanted, they wanted to murder this guy. There was such, not just unbelief, but hatred towards him. And now he's starting to talk about these eyewitnesses. Uh, and he starts talking about John the Baptist. And he says there in verse 35, He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. You see, the religious leaders came to hear John the Baptist. <laughs> they, they wanted to know, what is it, this strange fellow who's dressing so weirdly and has such strange habits, what is he saying? And they rejoiced in John for a while, he says, until they really learned what his message was. They loved the messenger, but they didn't like the message at all. And then he says in verse 36, but the testimony which I have is greater. It's greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. Jesus, there's some greater witnesses, and that's the miracles. The miracles that Jesus did were undeniable. In fact, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus in John the third chapter, he says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. 
Here's the great testimony about Jesus is his miracles. You see, Jesus didn't come and heal people because they had a pain in their back or because they had a headache. He was healing people who were blind and given sight, who were deaf and now could hear, who had leprosy, who had withered hands, who were dead and were raised from the dead. One guy had been dead and buried for such a long time that by the time Jesus raised him, his body was already stinking from decomposition. I mean, these miracles were amazing. And then he says, even beyond that, this is God's testimony, verses 37 and 38. The Father who sent me, he's testified of me. But you see, you've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe in him whom he sends. There's still this unbelief going on amongst these religious leaders. And so Jesus gives another witness the scriptures themselves he says you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life it is these that testify about me verse 40 get verse 40 i think verse 40 is the key right here verse 40 is the key to what's going on and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life they were unwilling that is the human response, being unwilling. People are just unwilling. It's not a lack of evidence. It's not a lack of testimony. It's not a lack of witnesses. It's a lack of will. They were unwilling. They didn't want to come to belief. They were unwilling. And uh, verse 41 and 42, despite their claim for godliness, they had no desire to live godly. Now then, one of the things that Scott really kind of amazes is that these guys were experts in the Scripture. They had great portions of the Old Testament memorized. And they thought that this is what was going to save them, is being able to keep that Old Testament perfectly. And they put all these added additions to the law because they wanted to make sure they did everything exactly right. But one thing they missed was the main point of the Old Testament. The main point of the Old Testament is Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, that's all about Jesus. John 1-1, same thing. <laughs> in the beginning was the Word. Jesus God. They're the same. He created everything. And then in Genesis, the third chapter, you just get barely started in Genesis, the third chapter, and verse 15. It says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. He's talking to the serpent. Some have called this the first mention of the gospel in the Bible. This is the gospel. That Satan would bruise the heel of Jesus. Jesus would be put to death. But then he would come to life in the resurrection and he would destroy the head of Satan by overcoming sin and death. And so you have this first mention of the gospel. Jesus is bruised, but overcomes. And then, of course, you just continue. The animal that was killed and clothes Adam and Eve, this idea that this animal needed to be taken and, and clothe them, and something needs to clothe us. And then in Abel, the blood sacrifice. And in Genesis, the 12th chapter, that Abraham and that all the nations of the world be blessed through his seed. It's repeated again in Genesis 22. And Paul talks about this. He says, this is not plural seeds. It's a seed. Talking about Jesus here. That it will be through Jesus that all the world be blessed. And Exodus. We have the great story of the, of the Exodus from Egypt. And that Passover lamb. Which pointed to who? Jesus. And Leviticus. The entire book of Leviticus is a foreshadowing of Jesus and what would take place in Jesus. This Levitical system is all about Jesus. In Deuteronomy, 
Moses talked about a prophet that would come, just like him. And they talked about the bronze serpent, and John mentions this in John the third chapter as well. All these things that point to Jesus, and they missed it all. It's an amazing thing to me. Here are people who knew all about the Bible, but somehow didn't notice that it was talking about someone who was to come. You know, sometimes we have people, they'll come to church for a while, and they, they'll fall away. Sometimes a young person, he says, you know, I just don't believe it anymore. Uh, what is the it? I don't believe it, it anymore. What's the it? Is the, it the Bible? What is the it? You see, the it for John was Jesus. It wasn't an it, it was a him. It was Jesus. And uh, it is that he was a Christ, the Son of God. We get so wrapped up sometimes in our Bible study, we miss the main point that Jesus is everything here. And that might sound strange to us too, that an expert in the Bible would miss the main point, but you might not realize this, but it's real important that you do, especially if you're sending your kids off to college. There are professors at our universities who are professors of religion, of professors of theology who are teaching the Bible, who do not believe in God, who are atheists. Some who are not atheists but agnostic do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I, 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 I met a college professor like that. I, I mean, he sounded good at the beginning until I realized, you don't believe in any of this. I bet he could tell you in minute, minute details all the different things and aspects of the New Testament. He knew it. It seemed like inside and out, and yet he missed the main point. You think, how in the world could he do that? Well... Jesus says is because he was unwilling to believe. They were unwilling to see what Moses is talking about. They were unwilling to come to Jesus so they could be saved. Almost the opposite of John's purpose that we might come to Jesus and be saved. Unbelief is a theme that began back in chapter 1. You might not have noticed it because it's a, a subtle subtle subcontext of the of the melody that he's been been giving but in chapter 1 verse 5 he says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it in verse 11 he came into his own and those who were his own did not receive him chapter 3 316 is that passage we all know so well I don't need to quote John 3, 16, but verse 19 says, This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. This is a fundamental teaching of the Bible, that sinners are unwilling to come to God. They can see, even if they see the full light, even if they see all the evidence and have all the testimony in the world, they can still be unwilling to believe. Sometimes we get the idea that if I could just tell the story of Jesus, they'll believe. No, that's not true. And it's going to continue to get worse as we go through the Gospel of John. For instance, in John, the seventh chapter, verse one. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Verses 19 and 20. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Verse 30. So they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Verse 44. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. In chapter 8, verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, that you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Verses 43 and 44. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies.
they were unwilling. It's almost like Isaiah 53. You know, who has heard this? Who has believed this? Who understands this? They're unwilling to know these things. And one more passage, John 12, verse 37. John 12, 37. But he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. In the midst of all this evidence and all these miracles, and like I said, he's not curing them from back pain or headaches. He's doing all these mighty works. And in the midst, seeing Jesus face to face, hearing him face to face, watching him, seeing him, doing these things. How in the world do you come to unbelief? So much unbelief today just amazes me. So many are unwilling. Richard Dawkins, maybe you've heard of Richard Dawkins, a, a famous atheist, one of the more, one of the better known atheists. Uh, he wrote The God Delusion. He thinks that Christians are deluded. He thinks there's something wrong with us. And uh, he's what we call the new atheist. Not only does he not believe in God, he's antagonistic to those who do. And he's after, uh, he, his goal is to destroy Christianity. And uh, they asked Richard Dawkins, what if you died and you came into the presence of God and God asked you why you didn't believe? What would you tell God? And his answer was the same answer that Bertland Russell, another famous atheist, gave. He said, I would tell God there was just not enough evidence. <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I look around and see the beauties of this world, I see so much evidence. How much more evidence could you possibly want than what we have? I see purpose and, and evidence in all the things around us. I mean, the fact that I'm here is evidence for the beauty in, of God. I mean, you know how you got here, right? <laughs> your mom and dad, and if it wasn't your mom and dad, well... That wasn't your fault, but somewhere along the line, your mother ovulated a seed and unconsciously perfumed the seed and made it attractive to these 300 million sperm that your father had produced. These 300, as many as the, the po total population of the United States, 300 million swimmers. And the first swimmer that got there fertilizes egg. So, look, it, if you've never won anything, hey, you won something a long time ago. You, you were faster than Michael Phelps. Uh, I mean, you were there. And amazing thing is, is that every aspect of who you are is right there in this little swimmer that is 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt. This egg that is about the size of a period in your Bible and they came together and all the DNA that makes you you was right there. Right there in that little thing. And you know, this DNA, DNA has this information that is equivalent to hundreds of encyclopedias. I mean, it's just unfathomable. Everything, and you know what, if any little bit of that DNA, any aspect of you get a chromosome or one or two off and you know there's big problems you may not survive. Everything has to work just exactly right and this comes together and this biological miracle takes place. And I think it, Richard Dawkins is a biologist, by the way, and he sees all this. He says, it's an amazing thing that in nature it shows so much purpose. Uh, but we know it was just accidental. I'm thinking, what? You don't see the evidence for God in all this purpose? Oh my goodness, we could just go on and on and we don't need to. Because see, the problem is not their intellect. And that's what you gotta understand. These guys are smart guys. It's not their intellect. These people Jesus were talking to, they were smart guys, it's not their intellect. It was their heart. They were unwilling. In Romans 1, when Paul's trying to talk to us about why there's so much unbelief in the world, he says, first of all, they denied God. 
and then they denied truth, and then they denied reality. That's Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Why suppress the truth? Because we want something and God is in the way. A preacher was talking about teaching in a high school class. He was a high school teacher, but he says, I, I, taught, I taught a class at the uh, medium security prison. And he says, and somehow in the conversation we got on to evolution, and, and one, of the, uh, one of the kids in the class said, I'll tell you why I believe in evolution, because I won't believe in God. It's not because there's not evidence. Not because there's not testimony. There's plenty. They're unwilling to believe. If you're not a Christian, it's not because of a lack of evidence. I'll tell you that right now. It's a lack of willingness. It's a lack of desire. You know, we follow this unbelief and hostility all the way through the Gospel of John, all the way to the cross. And then we're going to see it pick up in the book of Acts and it will continue all the way up to today. And we'll see it in persecution. You know, pers Christianity is for whosoever will. You know, we hear that. Whosoever will. That's it. Whosoever is willing. Whosoever is willing to look at the testimony and the evidence and, and willing to come. There's just so many who are unwilling. This is an amazing thing. It gives me insight. Why is there so many that don't believe? They're just unwilling to believe. And I don't know how that works exactly. I don't know how I can preach the gospel to some of you and you come and say, I want to be a Christian and you're baptized into Christ. You're raised to walk in news of life and you're trying to transform your life to be like Jesus. And I can tell the same story to someone else and they say, it's not for me. I don't want anything to do with it. Richard Dawkins if you ever read his book, it could be subtitled, There is no God, and I hate him. I mean, really, you got to know that there is a God, and that Jesus is that God who loved us and came to live for us and die for us and continues to live for us, and we live for him. Uh, Lloyd C. Douglas, uh, he wrote the, the Robe and some other novels. He says that when he was going to college that he lived off campus in a boarding house. And he lived upstairs and downstairs from him was a retired music teacher who was now in the later years of his life. He'd gone blind and he was housebound. And he said he had the same routine every morning. That uh, He said, I would go downstairs and knock on the door of this retired music teacher and I would open the door and say, well, what's the good news? And he would pick up a tuning fork and, and hit it on the side of his wheelchair and said, It's middle C. It was middle C yesterday. It will be middle C tomorrow. And it will be middle C a thousand years from now. The tenor upstairs is singing flat. The, hall, the piano down the hall is out of tune. But this is middle C. And it will always be. Be middle C. You know, we have a middle C that's always going to be a middle C. Jesus is not going to change. As the Hebrew writer said, He's the same yesterday, today, yes, and forever. He is here. That's why John wants us to believe. You, you know, John's saying, I, I want to I want to tell you the story about how I how I transform my life. I want to tell you about what I saw and what I heard and what I touched. I want to tell you about Jesus. I'm so glad that we are willing, that we are a whosoever, and that Jesus has given us so much reason and evidence for faith in Him. What an interesting story today. It's one of the sad stories of the Gospel of John. 
why we have unbelief. 